Hello, Jesse here, and welcome back to the Boston Commune. This week's incredulous installment is an extension of last week's theme, fighting against capitalism's deleterious effects on mental health. You'll hear commentary from Scott, Joe, Ellie, Kit, and myself, as well as comrade Alexandra, pronouns she or they, who deserves a proper introduction despite being unable to stay for the full show. Please do us a favor and share this content. Do yourself a favor and enjoy your epoch. Jesus Christ, every time. (laughs) Nobody knows who Craig is. Have you seen the ghost of Greg? It's Craig. Joe, you want to start with some current events? The world's on fire. How about yours? That's why I like it. We're never getting bored. <laughs> it's, it's irrelevant every week. I'm sorry. No, I actually wholeheartedly agree. I was going to say that. You beat me to that. But that's okay. Yeah, the world is on fire. Um, hey, now I'm Joe, an all-star. Are you Inmates... clicking your pen again, Joe? Mm, oh, not now. <laughs> That might have been more. Earlier, sorry. I always get blamed for it every time. Well, in all in all fairness, I mean, come on. It was the first two weeks only, you were clicking the entire only time. Only sometimes. <laughs> a couple things. The uh, the Attorney General of South Dakota ran over a person uh, yesterday, and he said that he hit a deer. He reported hitting a deer what? with his car on Saturday night. <laughs> But he actually yeah, what? killed a pedestrian whose body what? wasn't found until what Sunday What on earth morning. is this story? What? <laughs> I mean, even for 2020, this sounds this like some baseball with. stuff. What's your source, Joe? Uh, the Guardian. Okay. Uh, the Guardian reported this uh, yesterday. South Dakota's Attorney General Jason uh, Ravensborg reported hitting a deer with his car on Saturday night, but it actually turned out he killed a 55-year-old man whose body wasn't found until Sunday morning. That's what? Hard uh, fuck yeah. yeah. All right, that's been your episode of lore for this week. <laughs> <laughs> Holy he shit. was driving home from a uh, GOP fundraiser at like 110 miles an hour when he hit the guy. That's horrible. And... The governor is like trying to like slowly like walk back anything she's ever said about him like positively like I'm just gonna go like hide somewhere and hope the press doesn't notice that like we're like of the same party. Where was this again? South Dakota. Oh God. Yeah, I was there not that long ago, and um, judging by how violent people will get if you accidentally drive your car too close to them in a parking lot, it's a uh, it's a scary place. Sounds up for sure. And then the other is that... Do uh, you have more positive news, Joe? Or we, it's just going to be... Oh, just, no. Uh, news, just news, the trolley problem, but just we're running over everyone this week. Well, I'm going to get the positive <laughs> stuff after this one, because there was a lot of positive electoral stuff that happened last All week. Right. So. Oh, true. So the positive stuff comes at the end as dessert. Uh, there was a story that caught my attention again in The Guardian this morning, well, right before I had, a, you know, a cavity filled, uh, that uh, guards at a Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem, Oregon, were pepper spraying inmates, despite the fact that, like, air quality was already basically, like, enough to be, like, toxic to breathe. I would say I'm shocked, but I'm really not. That's the, uh, you guessed it, that's the secret phrase of the Epoch Incredulity. And now all of the uh, confetti comes down from the ceiling. <laughs> oh, is this like Tom Scott's Mystery Biscuits? And the the class, balloon that the says class congratulations class just slowly <laughs> yep, yep. falls to the ground. To note, we're going to make sure cops also includes correctional officers, just to make that clear. Yeah, my dad, who I don't talk to much anymore, is a corrections officer. <sighs> Not great. I'm deeply sorry. Could be worse. Could be in Oregon. Yeah. Moving on to the positive stuff. This is the there was basically an electoral landslide for the left uh, in Rhode Island last week. Oh. There was a massive landslide at the state legislative level when 15 out of 22 leftist candidates won primaries in Rhode Island's legislature. So that's like 13% of the entire legislature flipped in one night. Wow. Are we talking leftist as in like social democrat or? I mean, that is kind of like the, the left's edge of like what is 
left us in an electoral context right now in the United States. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But uh, this it was a coalition of like uh, the local DSA chapters, uh, Sunrise Working Families Party, and this new group, uh, Reclaim two new groups, Reclaim Rhode Island, which was founded by former Bernie organizers. There, uh, all four of their endorsed candidates won. And then there's this new group called the Rhode Island Political Co-op, which is basically a political group founded by like like longtime left wing act like organizers in Rhode Island. It was built to recruit and. Uh, provide infrastructure to their candidates. They ran a slate of like like eighteen candidates, and uh, like ten of them won. Like so, they went like ten for eighteen. They knocked off six incumbents. And wow. uh, the organization's platform is that they are calling for uh, single payer health care, raising the state minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour, and then tying it to inflation. They're for the Green New Deal. Their policy uh, page calls for criminal justice reform, which set, uh, states, "quote to fix broken and ra- the broken and racist criminal justice system and the school to prison pipeline and ban for profit private prisons." Uh, they also call for their platform calls for immigration justice, calling for or uh, giving driver's licenses to undocumented people and shutting down ICE detention centers. They call for increasing funding to public schools and making uh, tuition-free public colleges. Their platform also calls for campaign finance reform by imposing sharp limits on donations to political candidates and political parties and implementing public campaign financing, also raising taxes on the state's 1%. And also, uh, they have a lot of stuff on housing. Like, they call for uh, statewide rent control creating a state agency dedicated to enforcing rent control laws, uh, investigating alleged abuses, and prosecuting landlords who break rent control laws, uh, also calling for a $25 million annual budget line, budget line item in the state's budget to allocate consistent and reliable streams of revenue towards building and maintaining affordable housing among other things they have a uh, policy they have policy papers on healthcare taxation housing education and uh, the minimum wage uh, on their platform page that's amazing and two of them are in fact DSA members so we're not like we're not far off social socialist even if we're not quite there with everyone. Joe, I just want to make sure you're good with that pen, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that wasn't me. That was definitely you. That was absolutely I'm, you. Oh. I'm not holding a pen right now, so it's, it's okay. not me. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. If you hypothetically were holding a pen, <laughs> I it's would okay. wager that you may have been clicking it. <laughs> All right. But so, if you weren't, that's fif- so, 15 out of 22 is incredibly impressive. That yeah. is pretty amazing. Also, 15 seats, it doesn't sound like a lot, but there's only like 113 seats in the entire Rhode Island legislature. So left-wing candidates won like uh, like six seats in the state, uh, state house, six seats in the Senate, uh, and like another eight seats in the uh, House of Representatives. They knocked off six incumbents in one day. Yeah, it's amazing. Including this the- was Rhode Island? Yeah. Hell yeah. The state Senate Take that, Finance Lovecraft. Committee- <laughs> the state Senate Finance Committee Chairman and the state Senate uh, President Pro Tempore, who is basically like the number two guy in the Senate, state Senate. He presides over the state Senate instead of the Lieutenant Governor. Both of them lost. I love how that's two thirds of the primary seats that were taken by left wing politicians. This is a glorious day. Yeah, I'm calling it. Once Boston gets too shitty, I'm moving to Rhode Island. I have friends who are like very forward thinking who are way ahead of me and already have moved to Rhode Island. I have a friend in Connecticut, but I think I'm going to be stuck in Massachusetts for the time being. And that's okay because it just means we'll have to start winning seats here as well. I want to say two things. One, it leaves a bit of a sour taste in my mouth that the group is called Reclaiming Rhode Island, but it's not an indigenous group. Just going to throw that out there. And two, um, good point. Yeah, I don't know if we should <laughs> save that. <laughs> I don't know if we should save this until a little bit later in the discussion, but um, speaking of uh, defunding ICE. Oh, yeah. Some uh, eugenics happening that... Uh... <sighs> Yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah. it, it hasn't been. It it is. I, I guess at this point, it's still uh, unconfirmed. But I mean, fucking come on! Like it's happening. It's definitely yeah, it's, happening. It's Do we want to obvious. talk about eugenics before we talk about Michelle Wu or after? Well, let's talk about Michelle Wu first. And then yeah. We get into the eugenics, <laughs> 
So uh, Michelle Wu announced her intention to run for the uh, mayor of Boston this morning, which I don't even live in Boston, and I'm excited for that. Like, who's the only person I voted for? I mean, ever? <laughs> no, just the only person I voted for in that election cycle. I didn't vote for anybody else on the ticket. Whoa. I keep forgetting that Austin is part of Boston and that therefore you live in Boston. <laughs> Sorry, just doxing you a little bit. <laughs> Wait, but like Liz Breeden and Lee Nave had a... Um, that was the primary. Uh, Lee Nave didn't make it onto the second ballot. Uh, so in 2019, uh, Lee Nave and Liz Braden competed in the primary for Alston Brighton for that seat on the Boston City Council. Uh, Liz Breeden won. This was a little bit of a contentious thing within Boston DSA because our coalition partners, Right to the City, endorsed Liz Breeden. We endorsed Lee Nave, who's a member and like an outright socialist and had a much better backstory, just a really oh, impressive yeah. history hell, uh, working yeah. in Ferguson and like all of the anti-cop stuff and all of the like criminal justice reforms needs to happen now. And like incredible, incredible work that like Liz Breeden seemed nice and sort of wishy-washy in comparison. Uh, we endorsed Lee. Uh, we worked really hard for Lee and then and uh, Liz Breeden, like the Lee Nave campaign was rolled into Liz Breeden's campaign, though it didn't really matter at that point because there was no general challenger. Um, and then not much else happened. Like uh, Liz Breeden hired Lee Nave as chief of staff. As I guess, as Joe was saying a minute ago, uh, Liz Breeden uh, last week fired Lee Nave. Uh, there's a lot of backstory to that because there was a vote in which a large community group was asking the city councillors to vote down the uh, budget uh, because it did not include the cut to the police that they were asking for. Um, mm-hmm. Seven people voted for the budget, six voted, sorry, four, uh, five voted against. Uh, Liz Breeden had previously seemed to be supportive of voting down the budget and then switched her mind at the last minute. Um, Lee Nave was like working really hard on getting this through and incredibly supportive of defunding. And so everyone sort of knew that there was some amount of tension there, but this is like, like you fired a black man who just became a dad in the middle of a pandemic over disagreements about Black Lives Matter. Well done, white woman. No, yeah. just bad. Does anyone else get the vibe from uh, Liz Breeden that she's kind of like, if it's like if, Li- if if Elizabeth Warren did yoga or something? Yes, absolutely. Like if she was like a PETA activist? <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Oh, As no. your resident vegan, no. I think there is a difference between Liz Breeden, who is an anti-vaxxer, and Elizabeth Warren, who is, like, weirdly obsessed with data, as long as it helps her. Well, I mean, she is, like, the numbers person. Like, her whole thing was, like, I spent the last couple decades just pouring through bankruptcy data that everyone else would probably fall asleep trying to comprehend. Yeah, she's a wonk. Policy wonk. I love that term. Which is fine, but not what I want like like and still significantly better than Liz Breeden and still this minimizes the change that needs to be made because it doesn't ever advocate for a change in system but that's that's still way better than Liz Breeden right now yeah I have no regrets about not voting for Liz Breeden I'll just throw that out there yeah Lee Nade was a good fucking candidate he he campaigned in at least in Austin on uh implementing a flip tax and the amount and rate of gentrification in Austin Brighton I have seen it year by year and it fucking sucks it sucks like great Scott is gone now. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's some bullshit. And really, really sad. But isn't that kind of like a good summation of Boston city politics and most of the time it's a bunch of bullshit? Well, yeah, but Austin Brighton has held on to this kind of like, Austin is still, like it has two nicknames, Austin Rat City and Austin Rock City. Like it's still a very young population. Obviously it's a progressive kind of like <laughs> enclave, exclave, I guess, not enclave, like an exclave of Boston. Because if you look at a map, it's kind of like a tumor sticking out the side. But I mean, oh. it is fucked up. Up. Great way to describe like uh the rent prices in Austin have gone up every single year except for this past year like the, I mean the living costs have gone up everywhere in Boston but like it, I didn't think it would hit the western part of the city so hard but it has feels like everywhere housing prices are skyrocketing even when I was still in rural New York last year the housing prices in a town of 10,000, it was like a one room apartment would cost 800 a month without any utilities. Well, this is the contradiction of like applying supply and demand to housing, like because there's no way to create more supply. You can't just create more land. Well, that just means that supply and demand are fucking borked. 
Because now this should not be a commodity like a Star Wars set or something. Everyone needs housing. And it should be so illegal to have prices. This It should be illegal to charge for housing at all. We have yeah. six times the number of empty houses in the U.S. as we have homeless people. Thing. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Or just like a lot of units are like a hedge fund buys up like a bunch of units to park cash somewhere. Right. I mean, and they have them like furnished and they have electricity and gas and water turned onto them. And it's just a complete waste of resources and fucking money and labor and everything. These could all be affordable housing units with fucking solar panels on them. Yeah, it could end homelessness, literally, to say nobody's allowed to own more than one house or more than one apartment space. Like, I am in a situation where my housing is very much temporary. I would rather live in a Stalinka than nothing. And for those who don't know, Stalinkas were the first mass housing project developed by Soviet Union. They were very small apartments that were meant to house only one family, but would usually house multi-generational families. But I would rather live in that than have nothing at all. So I was nodding my head, but... Yeah, to see empty housing... See empty single per single family housing everywhere while there's people sleeping under bridges in Worcester just tears my heart. It's like the inverse of like what's like the housing situation in China where they have they are pre building like entire cities to like be able to like grow like the population can be able to grow into it. Like they have a surplus because they are prepared for like future population growth where we have the opposite problem of like we have all these units but we don't want to house anybody in them yeah it's like oh but you can get a house with enough hard work yeah i worked hard and i got my back injured for it where's my house or is my house or you get the boomers who are like, oh, these people who are about to be evicted, they should have saved up for a housing deposit. Yeah. The thing that's giving me so much life right now is, I don't remember, I think it was some tweet that was like, here's a great example of somebody like writing to their landlord to be like, no, I'm not responsible for the financial risk you took when you became a landlord. So I'm just going to keep staying here. Thanks. Like the thing I saw was like, when I get my, you know, I have an uncertain uh, situation with my employer or whatever, it was like we can talk about we can agree on a payment like once i you know once i hear from my employer or whatever it was and let's not forget i mean landlords did get a uh subsidy didn't they they had their mortgages yeah, suspended mortgage what during covid yeah yeah now the landlords are having a hissy fit they can't evict their tenants just before the cold season begins also noting that like refinancing is like Fuck them landlords. incredibly like like everyone is refinancing right now just like the, the rate is so so low it's insane we never we talked about the lawsuit <laughs> that fucking landlords brought against the state of Massachusetts. There's a federal lawsuit now against the CDC. Jesus Christ. Because the CDC issued a uh, eviction moratorium n- nationwide for, until the end of January. And it was in this political article and it was the funniest fucking passage because they were like, oh, well, I guess we were lobbying the wrong people. Uh, where is it? Saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> uh, quote, the CDC CDC, uh, the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, issued the order banning eviction, citing public health risks of pushing distressed tenants into homeless shelters or other crowded living conditions during the pandemic. The order surprised industry lobbyists, who'd focused most of their efforts on the Treasury Department and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Once landlords have paid expenses associated with the property, they keep on average just nine cents on every dollar paid in rent as profit. Oh no, I poured nine cents a dollar. That's impressive. Like, that's actually, like, a hospital, if you run a hospital, you get, like, 3% on a dollar for, like, returns a year. Like, 9% is, like, impressively high. Yeah, I've gotten, like, I've had a savings account for, I think, multiple years now, and I have 23 cents in interest earned, so. The whole time? Yep. Wait, you actually have savings? I know. Okay, it's fucked up. It's, it's fucked crazy. up. I've never Lies had this tight. before. It's lucky it's, man. I'm, I had like an anxiety God, attack. The, about he's it. a fucking... <laughs> Bourgeois, we you're, have you're a class show. enemy. What the fuck? No, I get. I here's, <laughs> I gave my entire stimulus check to somebody else. If that helps, toaster, a bath mat, and still have savings. It's right. not, every I little bit you. helps. Like every. All right. Single you know what? Bit. I am. I am officially amongst the bourgeoisie now. I fucking. <sighs> the bath mat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's yeah. Carlene's fault. She bought the toaster. <laughs> <laughs> Did we want she's, to she's give um, me a death stare right now? <laughs> move into the discussion of ice at the border and one yeah, last the, funny. Oh passage yeah, the eugenics. In that. Yeah, genocide. You know. There was one last passage in that the article about the landlords that are just too funny because it's a cell phone. Quote: While the order stipulates the struggling renters must do their best to make partial payments, landlords say the language is too vague to help, and that the blanket ban on, ban on evictions has taken away any incentive tenants <laughs> might have to work something out with their landlords. A Virginia landlord filed the first federal challenge to the new order on Tuesday, arguing. The CDC is misinterpreting is uh, misinterpreting its authority under the, a 1944 public health law that gives the agency certain powers to prevent communicable diseases from crossing state lines. "Quote: It's very easy to vilify landlords and to say evictions are bad, and therefore the landlords just need to take it on the chin." End quote. Said Caleb Kruckenberg, who represents the landlord. "Quote: My client, he's just a small businessman." End quote. Sometimes things are easy to say because they're true. small business. <laughs> no one's braver than our troops. <laughs> <laughs> no braver than our small business troops. Really stealing your income? I, it's a small business. Let's go fight the warriors of the small business. I think we're better warriors. Like, they're going to be a whole bunch of lazy people. Do we want to talk about the fucking border and the uh, eugenics going on there? Yes. Yeah. Because, like, I have hot dang at that. Like, everyone's complaining about China's genocide of the Uyghur. I don't think I got the pronunciation right. Those people. And we all yell at that, but then stuff, exact same thing goes on in the border, and it's like, oh, well, they shouldn't have come here. The hypocrisy, and, like, the only person that, like, stated out loud seems to be AOC, that this is a fucking genocide that we're committing. Yeah, I was thinking earlier explicitly about how when I read the news about it, about the stuff happening at our border, I was, like, exactly, I was exactly split in half. Sometimes I'm not exactly split in half with this, but, like, part of me was, like, Jesus fucking Christ. And then the other half of me was, like, well, I guess that's uh, the world we live in now. And then it, I didn't even think about it again until earlier when I was talking to you guys because I just couldn't bear to. It just tracks so perfectly with the like timeline of any declining capitalist empire and how it begins to evolve into fascism, like along pretty predictable lines. Yep. Saying earlier, Jesse, that it's like we've turned into Nazi Germany. I kind of disagree, seeing as the Nazi. The Nazis took their idea for the Holocaust from Jim Crow, and they were like, well, we have all these Jews, and we don't know what to do with them, but you have these great Jim Crow laws, you see, but we don't, with your Negroes, but we don't think you go far enough, so we're going to, like, figure out how to kill them more effectively, because well, we simply did, We did talk about the, the meme where the... the... <laughs> Joe, is that like a half-hearted attempt at a German accent? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. I'm getting lazy. We did. Actually, Scott was the one who brought this up, but we did talk about the meme of Nazis copying off of an American. And then the I Americans... saw that meme today again on Twitter. <laughs> it's very fitting. It's very apt. Yeah, it's like, Hans gets a thumb in Waffle. That's my accent. <laughs> that looks like accurate, uh, you know, accurate consonant pronounce- pronunciation. Any positive stuff going on other than the Rhode Island legislator bribery things? I went to the beach again. That's good. Yay. <laughs> it was low tide and it smelled like garbage, but it was, <laughs> it felt really good to like swim. <clears throat> Swimming feels good, man. Hey, I got one. Uh, Cats still exist. (laughs) Hamsters and ducks and uh, packets and capybaras. Have you all heard about the beefalo in Connecticut? No. So a few weeks ago, this beefalo escaped from a Connecticut farm and has been wandering the wilds ever since. And recently, state of Florida offered to take it to a sanctuary in Florida once it's found. Aww. What is a beefalo? It's a buffalo that has cow ancestry. They've been trying to, you know, they've been crossbreeding them with cows to keep the population alive. Was that true, what you just said? Yeah, that's 100% true. (laughs) That's 100% beefalo facts right there. Fascinating. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a Yeah, your fucking segment. I'm sorry. (laughs) Jesse wrote all of the... You wrote a song for it. Jingles. 
I did. Oh, yeah. Uh, You're going to have your segment? Yeah, sure. Do I it. Mean, Do it while I'm turning off my phone and computer and everything. Okay. So this segment is called Rabid Radlibs, and the audio got a little garbled on the live stream. I had to re-record some of what I said so that it was intelligible. So the point of the segment is Jesse is going to go after some liberal talking points that, you know, don't actually propose any real structural change or just mostly air and means testing. Yes. Thank you, Scott. So the I am I the writer. <laughs> the phrase that I wanted to tackle today is, quote, judging a demonstration by its most violent participants, but not judging a police force by its most violent cops is the language of the oppressor. Quote. Uh... <laughs> And I wanted to talk about this because I do see a lot of people making these signs, and I think it brings attention to the wrong aspects of the system. The statement invalidates the use of force by oppressed people and shifts the focus away from conditions that compel retaliatory violence. It also reflects an ideology of personal responsibility rather than one of solidarity, because the power struggle is systemic and rooted in class antagonism, bolstered by white supremacy and many forms of bigotry. Mildly annoyed every time I hear hear the phrase personal responsibility. Yeah. Yep. It's a right-wing talking point. It's right up there with the bootstraps. I think it also propagates the narrative that passive demonstrations are being hijacked by outside agitators, and this limits the potential impact of protests because then they pose no real threat to the capitalist class and they only serve as public awareness campaigns. I think this language also attempts to alienate the most radical and militant protesters from the movement, which sows more disunity amongst the left. And uh, what came to mind for me was that violence can come in many forms. Sanctions, imprisonment, eviction, deportation, emotional and sexual abuse... But the destruction of private property is not violence. All police are complicit in upholding the state monopoly on violence. So it's unnecessary to distinguish the most violent oppressors from their ostensibly non-violent or less violent accomplices. Particularly when police unions are even stronger than regular labor unions. If, is it okay if I step in on this part? Sure. Yeah, that reminds me of a saying I heard. If you have 1,300 good cops and and 12 bad cops and the 1,300 good cops don't turn in the 12 bad cops, you have 13, 12 bad cops. (laughs) Dope. Yes, no, I mean, that's a good point, and it's also a great reference. Yeah, also, my, like, police kind of, they try to claim they have that responsibility for law and order, they set everything just, and then they don't turn in the most violent, and we don't judge them for not turning in the most violent, the liberals, I mean. But as soon as one protester smashes a beer bottle on the street, then suddenly, oh, it's a protester's fault that they're not turning in the one protester who literally didn't hurt anyone, maybe a window at most. Yeah, I know exactly why people like to claim or at least feel like, or, you know, make the argument that whatever violent, the destruction of personal property is violence. The violence that's in, the only violence in that is the fact that capital doesn't provide you with what you need so if somebody breaks your shit you have to spend money to get more of it like the problem that's, per- is- that's personal property that's not private property oh no fuck i always get those two mixed up i know that's why that's why <laughs> i always make that distinction well, i think you. it's a bit more pernicious than that because uh it has more to do with the libertarian ideology of uh the perception under the libertarian ideology that like property rights pro- whether it be like personal property or private property is is more important than human right. I think the whole the whole message to me smacks of this like like oh well we're better than the Black Panthers because we don't need to use violence to like mm-hmm. you know get our fucking demands across. Like if you need to use some sort of violence in like to protect to literally protect your lives, your community from an oppressive military or police or right wing nationalist force, like go ahead. I have no fucking problem with that. In fact, I encourage it, as we were talking about before we started the podcast. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, you know, having a gun doesn't make you violent. It makes you sensible, in my opinion. Yes. Endorse. 
endorsement. All right. Anyways. <laughs> funnily, no, funny enough, uh, earlier today, my roommate, we were talking about, we were talking about guns and gun control. And we were talking about, uh, you know, the Marxist or the Marx quote that uh, a well-armed proletariat, you know, is a safe one or whatever the quote is. Um, and my roommate, who's a little bit more apolitical, said, yeah, like the working class should have guns. They're the people who need them more. So he, he was like, they should get the guns first. Yeah. I got into this huge uh, discussion with my partner about Kyle Rittenhouse and whether you know, the whole like self-defense argument or whatever. And we kind of, you know, took away from it that, you know, you don't, again, you don't have to fire a gun to use the gun. Like pointing a gun is freq- is like technically a nonviolent form of exerting power. And I'm thinking also of whoever it was that, um, not one of you guys, it was like some famous person who used no. that analogy. No, it wasn't. No. It was it, some famous yeah. person and it wasn't no. one of us? <laughs> It might have been Chomsky, honestly. It might have been my boy Chomsky, who was saying, like, you know, the U.S. effectively points is a pointed gun at the rest of the world. They're like, you know, give us your money, give us your resources, etc. And it's like, well, we're not shooting. We're not taking one over. We're not firing a gun, but you're pointing a gun. Like, pointing a gun is valid. And also, I don't think they're valid. Like, the U.S. should disarm a whole bunch. And also, the police should be disarmed. I'm also not with army people randomly that create a lot of sides. You're cutting in and out again, Kit. Oh, no. The U.S. also does this via the World Bank. Like, the only reason Vietnam is opening a business is because they're not allowed to get World World Bank aid without having some Thank level you. of private enterprise. Thank you. Yeah, you cannot have a completely socialist country without having all the resources in the world when there's still capitalists around that are holding your economy at gunpoint. That's why it exactly. fucking bugs me when people say like, oh, Vietnam isn't actually socialist. Like, they fucking tried, you know what I mean? <laughs> They, they did are, their they... fucking best. Like, they follow Ho Chi Minh thought slash Marxist thought. Like, if you, I mean, I've never actually been able to listen to, like, uh, you know, Vietnamese Congress talking, like, in native language, because I can't speak Vietnamese, but it is pretty reminiscent of the conversations that, that we have, but they have a, a very strong attachment to sort of orthodox Mar- Marxist principles, and they also have, like, a very strong cultural component that they want to uphold and they're always fucking between a rock and a hard place because they have to satisfy the desires of these fucking capitalist empires Mm -hmm. yeah so it's like we try as much as we can like i'd say vietnam and cuba are as close as you can get to socialist while still being like forced to uphold some capitalism because otherwise you just can't get the raw resources your people need to survive. It would take a global proletariat revolution to finally liberate everyone once and for all. Yeah. This is why it's silly you when know, people just... say, like, the Nordic countries are socialists. This is why it's very don't silly even, when people don't say even that. Give me, don't even no, give I know, me. I know. I'll save that for next week. Democracy. I'll save for next week. Child <laughs> brain when people say that. <laughs> but Vietnam is like, uh, they're like market socialists to the degree that is possible, you know, while having the IMS boot on you, realistically. And Cuba, I mean, sure, they've achieved socialism, well, kind of-ish, but, like, they, they're still being strangled economically by an American trade embargo. Yeah, they have sanctions out the ass. And then Venezuela, which isn't even, like, they're like a petro state that's trying to do, like, a welfare state with, like, its oil money. And the second they start, like, uh, bucking the IMF and the WTO, it's, we're going to strangle the fuck out of you with sanctions to the point where, like, everything is useless. And a, and a counter-revolution, too. I have to say this about Venezuela because I haven't yet on this podcast but to understand exactly how fucked venezuela is when it comes to foreign policy venezuela currently has more crude oil resources than every other opec nation combined and they are exporting crude oil so that they can import gasoline because they don't have the infrastructure to refine it in their own country that is how fucked they are yeah (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, go ahead. Like, at least they're, like, they have a, their government hasn't been, like, overthrown recently in the way that, like, the U.S. has succeeded <laughs> in throwing other governments. Uh, <laughs> about that. Oh, they've tried, though. They tried. That's, that's, that's the point I was getting at. I was under the impression that was still going on. No, it's kind of like how we treat Iran, like, where, uh, where we, like, every now and then we try to overthrow their government and then it doesn't work and then we just kind of, like, try again a few years later. What's that guy's name? 
The guy who thinks well, he's it, president. It did work, um, but like Yeah, it did work in Iran. That was a that was a US funded uh Well I was talking about like what I mean by like we were trying to overthrow the government, I was talking like post nineteen seventy nine. Oh, okay. Because we overthrew the government in fifty three and then the revolution happened in nineteen seventy nine and we've been trying to overthrow their government so they get like to it reinstall like an American puppet since then because like well fuck we can't control their oil money. Juan Guaido was the first one I was thinking of. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, what I Googled was Venezuela fake president, and Google <laughs> autofilled it, so... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Google. The Baked man who thought held. he was president. I will say it's hilarious that, like, when Trump tried to talk to him the way he pronounced his name wrong. Juan Guido. I love Hispanics, quote unquote. Is that like how he loves Jews? Oh, did he do one of those too? Yeah. I don't think he's. He, has he? Collect them all. <laughs> yeah. No, no, he did. He he did. He said, uh, he said his, I think he said his accountant is Jewish. Oh, cool. Or his oh, lawyer's no. Jewish or something. Oh, that's not a compliment, <laughs> sir, in the way you think it is. Oh boy! Remember, black voters. <laughs> remember when Trump uh, waved the LGBT flag upside down? No, no. Like he doesn't even know he how like, a rainbow he, works. <laughs> he like hugged it. Oh, he failed first grade. What do you think at the end of a Trump rainbow? What do you think at the I end mean, of it? The setup. What is it? Yeah, I, I'm curious. Open I, I want to know. Uh, luck, luck. Oh. I'm ever ending hallway of mirrors in which your death is reflected. I don't know. No luck. Everyone says that on like the Midas touch or everything touched during the gold, he has the Mierdas touch because everything he touches goes to crap. I think at the end of the rainbow would be a pot of crap with that same logic. Yeah, that works. That works. <laughs> If it, I was gonna go in a much darker direction if it was like whatever he wanted to be at the end, but it, yeah. I'm not gonna go there because it was really mean. That that sounds more entertaining. No, I don't know. I guess we'll say it and then you can cut it out later if you want. I was just gonna be like, <laughs> it was uh, you know. Now you pot, have to say it. <laughs> it's a part of his daddy loving him. Ooh, oh. yeah. actually, like well, that's <laughs> yeah. Cut that out. I was gonna I'm go in a psychological <laughs> direction also. That like makes me nauseous. Stop trying to make us empathize with him. Yeah, Trump going, my father used to punish me severely. Anyone watch Oversimplified? I'm not saying anything about empathy, Joe, I'm just saying. Let's do our presentation now. I don't want to talk and about it. Let's get Alright, so something that I've been thinking about a lot lately for the past like two, exactly two months actually, I remember it being my birthday when I decided I wanted to like do something about this, um, which was July 15th. So now it's September 15th uh, in recording time. So full disclosure, this is a presentation I'm giving at the general meeting on Saturday at two o'clock or some point after that. And yeah, it's about um, resisting the mind virus that capitalism puts into into us. I, I can use words um, that convinces us we need to be productive and useful at all times and ties our worth to our productivity and Oof. all those good things. That's the thing. I think, you know, the battlefield is in the streets and it's between cops and protesters, but it's also in our brains between capitalism and us, like the part of us that, I don't know, that, that's the whole thing. I could get, <laughs> I could get into ego dynamics, but I'm not going to do that. Telling you to Long go story get short. job. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I got that productivity worry a lot as well. Like, oh my goodness, the amount of times where I feel like I'm lazy because no one's calling me about housing shit and then I blame myself for it even though there's no reason for me to. Right, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. So actually, so before, you know, that's the topic here, but before I get into the topic, I actually want to just kind of pay tribute to the fact that in this country, rest is not actually equally distributed. Like I want to talk about reclaiming time for rest reclaiming our time for like nourishing ourselves and resting and stuff but it bears mentioning that um you know some of our comrades actually don't have they have limited or no access um to rest and downtime and relaxation in the first place you know some people are working multiple jobs um some people have to use all their available energy and time just to like keep their families alive keep themselves alive and a lot of us can't really seem to get enough sleep 
at all ever so like you know that's a thing if that's you we see you we're fighting for you and actually i'm trying to nevertheless you know i'm trying to make this whole topic accessible and useful to folks regardless of how much rest you have access to hopefully like somebody everybody can get a little something out of it um to go in a little bit more detail about that basically there is a section of the u.s workforce that works more than one job um depending on who you ask i found figures of eight percent fifteen percent so it's probably somewhere around there and most of those folks are black um no surprise let's see the quote i have for one of my sources is fewer black people are able to sleep for the recommended six to nine nightly hours than any other ethnic group in the united states so who's getting the most sleep and the best sleep obviously it's white people um there was actually a really cool art installation at madrid pride in 2018 called black power naps that kind of addressed this issue um i would highly recommend checking out their website or just googling black power naps you can find it pretty easily um and the one of the things in their manifesto is the phrase reparation must come from the institution under many shapes, one of them being the redistribution of rest, relaxation, and downtime. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, oh, and big surprise, poor people don't get in as many as as many sleeps, as many sleeps as wealthy people, and not quite uh, as good of sleep as well. And so as many sleeps. As many sleeps. <laughs> Um, I was kind of focusing... The grammar anarchist in me is resisting the urge to say anything. The grammarchist? Are you a grammarchist now, Joe? I always have been. It's just, <laughs> I'm, I've been mellowing out in the last couple of years. The sleeps are good. Yeah, I was kind of focusing on sleep here, kind of, you know, it's not a perfect, uh, you know, way to look at how much sleep someone gets or how much rest someone has access to, but I feel like it's like a pretty good measure, um... In all these studies I was looking at, it wasn't always just that people don't have time to sleep because of their jobs per se, but that was kind of one aspect of the problem. The other stuff is, you know, things that you're more likely to face as a member of a marginalized racial group or socioeconomic group. And um, some of these things that I found can be directly related to employment or kind of intertwined with it, such as unemployment, uh, depression, limited access to health care. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff like depression, anxiety, dissatisfaction, lower quality of life, family demands, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, so that's the, that's how that is. Usual um, suspects. <laughs> usual yeah. suspects. Moving forward, um, Alexandra, I know you mentioned you've definitely felt guilty for not getting enough done or whatever in a free period of time. How about the rest of you guys? Ever felt that way? Oh, all the yeah. fucking time, yeah. All the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Felt what way? Oh, yeah. Um, have oh, you ever, yeah. like, had a day off and then at the end of it been like, shit, I didn't get enough done today? Like, Fuck, I'm the worst. No, not really. Oh, nice. Okay, Joe is well Joe done, is our Joe. You lie, <laughs> sir. A round of applause well, for Joe. <laughs> but I don't really get that much sleep, so that's true. Okay, that's Sorry. true. He doesn't right. have he doesn't have the ability to focus on his uh, lack of, thereof. Yeah, whatever it is, that's that's either good or bad. Now I can't even decide. Anyway, so you guys get the picture. Like the rest of us have definitely felt this. Like, oh, I'm I'm just like a worthless human being because I didn't check enough things off my list on this Saturday or whatever. Um, and it's silly because often it's like, but like one thing was really hard. Right. Or, like I took space and went for a walk and didn't get one more thing. Thing done. Like, Damn <laughs> I shouldn't it, I have taken that, that thing down. Fucking self indulgent walk. Oh my god, I'm such a lush kind of thing, right? Anyway, so there's like, as we, I'll actually touch on this later, there are a few different things that probably are, you know, contributing to this sort of feeling in your personal life. But uh, the one that we all probably have in common is what's sometimes just called hustle 24 seven culture. At least that's the a name that came up when I was kind of doing my research here. Um, and that shit's everywhere, man. Um, how many of you guys know about bullet journals? <laughs> I don't think that like bullet journals are inherently evil per se. I just think that the fact that they exist is a really like good litmus test for where we're at in terms of this issue as a culture. Like this image that I have here says like organization and productivity. It's like uh, this will help you be productive kind of thing. Question, what's a bullet journal? Um, a bullet journal is a type 
of like planner kind of thing that you can get and it's sort of interesting actually there's most of them are like kind of blank ish or like you're encouraged to organize stuff in whatever way looks like aesthetically pleasing to you you kind of have to do it yourself um so that's kind of interesting and you can like draw flowers all over it if you want I, that's what my the friends that i know do I thought you were going to say it's a it's a journal in which you document all the interactions you have with your ammunition <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it looks like it. So you put these little dots <laughs> by things to do, and each one of them feels like a bullet because it's so, so damn hard. And then right. you're supposed to put like little right arrows you have to do in the future. Now, that's just like shooting your future self. Oh. And you have to do a little at left arrow. Like that, that's if you like did it earlier than you planned. That's totally shooting your past self. Wow. So I think there, like, there totally could be like ammunition references in this if you so inclined to. That kid apparently knows better and more about bullet journals than I do. Go on, sorry. Sorry, no, I, I stayed up all Saturday night because someone had mentioned this and I was like, how similar to this is this journal to like my journal? Oh. And it's nothing like I keep a productivity-ish journal, but my productivity-ish journal is like, huh, I see this pattern. How would I like to fix it? Rather than like, this is the to-do list set of things that must be done. Okay, so yeah, the thing you have sounds a little more reasonable. Is it kind of like its own proprietary thing? Like this is the style and this is the way, you know, this symbol means this and stuff like that yeah someone did like did a design of one th- and then people have added extra like this is how i do what they call spreads mm-hmm. um, Jeez, it's like the like, we work of journals way. Yeah. It is totally the way oh, work no. of journals. And it has this, like, yeah, it sounds like a to-do list crossed with the secret. Yes. Yes, that is exactly it. <laughs> Wow. Okay, but, great. That's perfect. We'll keep going. Ellie, can you explain why do you think that they aren't inherently evil? Um, I think that, you know, you know, it's, I'm not sure I can make an extremely coherent argument about this. Yeah, I think you took a little to... bit too long to hesitate. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like I have, I have a thought, but I'm not sure it's a good thought. So you may have to go back and get rid of it later. Like, the philosophy behind it is actually pretty... It's, like, stress can be things that are in your head that aren't tracked anymore. Let's just get it all out of your head. And, okay, yeah. And so, like, that can be helpful whether your, like, goal is to get things done or not. Unfortunately, the focus of getting things done, and that this is a to-do list, it's never a done list, is actually really frustrating <laughs> because it leaves out any reflection or assessment of patterns about the tasks themselves rather than the patterns of the tasks like you can you can totally do a tracker of like this is my month this is how many calories i did or this is how stressed i was every day but it every single thing that's in there is a to-do item which is makes this extra like you don't get space away from that there's no that is what it's there for and it's it's not that like there's no journaling in a journal like the, the most similar thing they have there is a note it's like you don't have to do anything with this you just put a dash before like the thing you say but it's hard to say long complicated thing a note it's not designed that way and our world is complicated that said not everything in our world is complicated so that it has a place mm. right yeah i don't know i think it's like it can help you if it's like you know, if you're doing something that you want, if it helps you do something that you want to do, I think there is a small amount of value in that. However, we do, yeah, kind of have to look at it. It's like the conversations we've had about like Turo and stuff. It's like, it comes down to how you feel about it and how you interpret it basically. Yeah. I think like anything else, there's the personal. All right, Drew, (laughs) Jesus Christ. Everything has to be so fucking secular with you. (laughs) There's the personal level of it, and then there's the societal level of it. And I mostly want to look at the societal level while acknowledging the personal level. Like, everything has that. Everything has both of those layers to it. It's like, I don't know, if... As a working group, if we negated the individual experience, like as a mental health working group, we would not be doing our job. So I think it absolutely makes sense to look at the individual experience as well as the way that each of us fits into our communities, respectively and collectively, because this is the Boston Commune. So yeah, no, thank you guys so much. Honestly, that was such a beautiful bump set spike. I had like so little to say about bullet journals, but I knew that they like like had a lot there's a lot there you just just dug it up 
put it put it in front of us. There it is. Beautiful. Um, keep talking if you'd like. If you have other things to say about bullet journals, because this is great. Nope. No, nope. nobody. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Joe thinks down as I get. <laughs> Joe thinks I, through. Wait, wait. Wait, wait, get, get. I think to summarize, this is a way to journal tasks, and it leaves out the rest of the world that is not tasks, because there is a lot of tasks in life, and there are a lot of thoughts that don't fit in a tweet. And that's sad, and that's missing something. But it can be helpful, and it can help some people, and that's important. It's just journals are supposed to be more than that. Yeah, I think that anything you anything you buy that is half the secret and has its own like language and symbol set kind of, you know, is... I don't want to call it an institution per per se, but it's like a small cultural thing that influences the way you think about stuff. And probably most people that are buying bullet journals are really able to notice that or think about it critically, which is, you know, that's how most folks are. And it's not really like their fault per se. Um, so yeah, bullet journals. <laughs> I could give like a parallel, which is for me, that's kind of like what Narcotics Anonymous is like, um, because we do have kind of have our own language and we have the step working guide which is like a regimented set of questions in the order that they're in for a reason and I guess the difference is that un- unlike something like a bullet journal it's you learn patterns by looking at individual examples so like by going over the resentments that I held especially when I was using and when I was just getting clean like I picked up on a pattern of my own uh, biases and behaviors and how like the world wasn't actually out to get me, which was very liberating in a way because it gave me the opportunity to like work on myself. So, okay. So like NA is also kind of an institution, except instead of kind of drilling into your head, this idea that life is a series of tasks to be done. It actually helped you like think healthily and grow and be a better person. Absolutely. Okay. That's a good example. Thank you. Um, anyway, that's so yeah, bullet journals are a thing. Um, I also have like this book cover as book cover in the in the slideshow that's like written by one of the guys from Shark Tank. It's just called Rise and Grind. It's a picture of him like straightening his tie, getting ready to go grind some some grind and and uh work at the business factory and uh increase his <laughs> self image <laughs> self image. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Damon John. It's not your fault. Dead inside. Except it totally is. Okay. Um, also, I found some really great hashtags from the social meds, such as hashtag sleep is for losers, um, hashtag grind never stops, hashtag money doesn't sleep, and hashtag hustle hard. So hustle that's that out there. Stuff, out, stuff like that. Um, I have this wonderful... Uh, a uh, series of tweets from good old Elon Musk, uh, which, Jesse, can you read this? I can't do the accent. <laughs> Don't even do his real accent. Just do something stupid. Join to create exciting new worlds of technology. You're getting things on matters to you. And SpaceX, Tesla, Boeing Company, and Neuralink are the places to be. There are easier places to work, but nobody changed the world on 40 hours a week. But if you love what you do, it mostly doesn't feel like work. And then somebody named Margaret Mposi asked him, what's the correct number of hours a week to change the world? And he said, well, it varies per person, but about 80 sustained, peaking above 100 at times, pain level increases exponentially above 80. There you go. Jesse from the future, I'm sorry that you had to endure that. Uh, Alexander had to leave at this point, so we wished her well, and we hope to have her on again soon. And somebody actually replied to that, and William Mosley, 10101, William Mosley replied to that and said, man, you haven't put 100 hours a week in anything but Twitter. So yeah, this is a, it's a culture we live in, essentially. Um, even if you don't read Elon Musk's tweets, they're there, you know, they're out there poisoning the thinkosphere and... Uh, <laughs> It's a technical term. The thinkosphere. Um, the thinkosphere. Oh, yeah, no, you know, shit gets into your brain. You know, even if you don't own a TV, if you don't use Facebook, shit still reaches you because humans are transmitters. You know, we are viral transmitters of thought, and I could. That's a whole other episode. We're not even going to go there today. Um, anyway. Viral transmission. <laughs> I would so, like to quickly point out that like a hundred hours a week to anything is to- that, that's a true commitment because that's like fifty nine and a half percent of all the hours in an entire week. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's too many hours. 40 hours is too many hours, quite frankly. 59 and a half percent. Yep. And that's not even math. counting how much time you spend on the toilet. Um. Anyway, so yeah, so the bottom line here is this is like, you know, we know that the Protestant work ethic or whatever is like one of the dominant ideals of white American culture. So it makes sense. There is context for this. But honestly, you know, things have gotten out of control, out of hand. And it's probably been this way for longer than we think it has. Um, we're spending more time at work than we need to be. We are straining our personal relationships. We're increasing our, our risk of, you know, heart disease, diabetes, physical ailments, such and, and also mental stuff like depression and anxiety. And this shit, you know, grinds you down. It lowers your lifespan, literally. And we feel this way not just when we're at work, but when we're not at work. And this is what makes me super angry. Especially, like, all of this makes me angry, but this was the part where I was like, you know what? People are not talking about this. Uh, I'm going to say something. You know, this is like, this is the psychological warfare division of the capitalist machine. Um, and it doesn't even know it's doing it, I hope. Uh, <laughs> but like, you know, growing up is hard enough. A lot of us already have trauma histories. And then there's just all this institutional shame and guilt on top of that. If we feel like, you know, we spent uh, a whole weekend doing only a couple, it's like, it's like it was saying, you know, even if you had a 10, uh, 10 item to do list and you did didn't do all 10 of them you only did nine because you took a 30 minute walk or whatever to to be good to yourself and to give yourself a break you're still gonna be like ah oh, fuck i could have you know i could have checked off but i didn't do it I didn't didn't make it all the way there what is enough when can we feel like we've done enough like you don't really get that validated for you i guarantee you if you put in you know like elon said if you put in a hundred hour work week or whatever and somehow manage to also like organize your whole house, help your kids with their homework, and then like start, you know, a side hustle uh, from your home office selling something on Etsy. I think when I was running through this presentation, the first thing that came out of my mouth was like, you're selling beans in a box on Etsy. And now I just sound like a Joe Biden or something. <laughs> That sounds exactly yeah. like something you would say. Even if you're doing all this stuff and you're selling beans in a box on Etsy, do you get, does your doorbell ring at the end of that week and some guy hands you a trophy and says, congratulations, it's finally okay to feel like a, you know, valuable and worthy human being? No, that doesn't happen. Like, that never happens. And the, These are the four delicious words. The game is rigged. So why is it rigged? Well, there's a lot of shit behind this. One of the things that I actually thought was really interesting I discovered while I was researching for all this is that um, so back in 2001, um, author and educator Tama Okun and uh, Kenneth Jones put out a cool workbook called Dismantling Racism Workbook. And uh, it's more geared toward organizations than toward individuals. They identified 15 characteristics of white supremacy culture. And I was like, oh, white supremacy yeah, has a culture. It makes sense. Shit has cultures. Anyway, um, they identified 15 things. And one of them was sense of urgency, which is like this feeling of, you know, needing to keep going and going all the time and doing things as fast as possible, getting as much done. You know, it's kind of all interrelated. Um, and yeah, this is literally part of white supremacy culture. Fortunately, in this workbook, these two folks um, also talked about antidotes to each of these 15 things. And one of the antidotes they recommended for sense of urgency was build space for stillness and rest. And I thought, hey, you know, that applies on the personal level as well as the organizational level. So how do we do that? And weirdly enough, the first place that my brain went was directly into Judaism because it just so happens that historically, you know, like not every Jewish person is going to practice this today the way that it's historically been practiced, but a lot of people do. Um, it's literally, it's basically a holiday of Shabbat, which is the Sabbath, which is every, uh, traditionally, it's every Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown. And traditionally, that those you know 24 ish hours are supposed to feel as special and separate as any holiday um i have this great i found this great excerpt from an essay called an essay for students of the tree of life of sacred time the greater essay was written by a rabbi zalman Shachter shalomi who's one of the um founders of the jewish renewal movement and uh it was interpreted by shir yakov fight and this excerpt is he says so i'm gonna use the g word here just just to warn you. Also, for the record, I'm not trying to convert anybody to Judaism. I'm just talking about 
uh, some stuff that is true within Judaism. So he writes, how can we become intimate with God through the aspect of time? Today, it is critical to be clear on this because we are bitterly alienated by our relationship with time. Global markets equate time with money, as they say, quote, time is money. All of the holiness and majesty of time, perspective, patience, our capacity for compassion through which time transforms us has been lost on us. Were it not for the vestige of Shabbat, we would have lost our last refuge from the pressure of work time, the commercialization of our lives. We are taxed by busy work and burdened by endless tasks, oppressed by uninspiring labor, exhausting and distorting our human bodies and souls. Instead of living according to, quote, organic time, natural and healthy and divinely overseen, we live lives where every hour must be, quote, productive, fruitful, helpful, or useful lest it appear to be, quote, a waste of time in the eyes of the taskmasters, those who have conquered our minds and oppress us. Even times of rest, sleep, and relaxation we justify as necessary only to improve, maintain, and strengthen our work. We labor like slaves bonded to servitude. Thank God we have the calendar year and sacred times. Grasping these holy days is to be in possession of the tree of life. That's a Kabbalistic thing. Um, in sanctified time, we are freed from this pressure and live in remembrance of our freedoms. The person who has has compassion upon themselves, takes a moment from any ordinary morning and recalls the love and sanctity of Passover. In the afternoon, we recall the internal, careful clarity of Shavuot. Ordinary evenings are illuminated by Sukkot. We are protected in your shadowing presence. Between each and every breath, even in the midst of a work day, it is possible to, quote, remember Shabbat and sanctify it. I'm a momentary holy sabbatical in the heart. And I thought that was pretty great. It's like a very nice leftist take. And um, obviously, you know, those of us who don't come from Jewish backgrounds don't really have experience celebrating Shavuot or Sukkot or whatever. Um, but think about like Christmas. Think about Thanksgiving. You know, um, ideally, those days are very separate. They feel separate from the calendar. Like you don't stress about stuff because it's Christmas. Like hopefully you don't. I know people who do. <laughs> but, you know, like work, work can wait. It's Christmas. Fuck it. You know, stuff like that. It's that kind of feeling. And I think we just have been taught that, you know, well, I don't know. So basically, I know that the Christian traditions do mostly um, carry down that idea of a, the seventh day as a day of rest. Um, but as far as I can tell, again, I wasn't raised in a Christian environment, so I'm not an expert. But as far as I can tell from people I've known, um, I think that that kind of fervent cherishing has not really carried down through the uh, Christian adaptation. No, it's really not. It's not taken seriously at all. Yeah, right? Like, maybe you're going to watch football. It's a relic of the past. I mean, at most, it's like, uh, yeah, football, and that's about it. Yeah, you're going to watch football. You're probably going to go to the grocery store. Or even worse, you have to wake up fucking early to get ready to go to church or whatever. <laughs> right. I mean, Actually, I was I was dragged to church so many years against my will. And that's the thing. Like, this is weird. This is a weird comparison because obviously relatable, Joe. Here. But yeah, like ob obligatory. You still end up having to do obligatory shit on Sundays. Um, so it's not really the same thing. But anyway, Reb Zalman's point was that anybody who has, quote, compassion upon themselves can make a little tiny Shabbat, can make a little holiday for themselves, even for just a, just a couple minutes. Um. And you just you, you just have to decide that those two minutes are, you know, you, could, you don't have to call it sacred, but you know what I mean. And you just have to treat it that way. And obviously, this is a billion times easier said than done. So let's let's talk some more about uh, the, you know, this actually, there is a word for this already. It's self-care. Um, Audre Lorde once said, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. So that's even like another layer to it right there. It's like a thing you can do. And oh, by the way, it's political warfare. <laughs> so why do you have? Can you move back to that slide? Oh, yeah. So why do you have the why do you have? Lord, Jesse, cut this part out because it's a, it's a surprise for Saturday, but I'll show you guys right now. Anyway, so unfortunately, even self-care has now been kind of co-opted and commodified by, you know, mainstream capitalist culture. It's like now yet another form of consumption, like a thing we're supposed to do, uh, you know, performatively and, and demonstrably as part of being like, quote unquote, successful on top of, you know, the 80 hour work week and the sparkling home and the impeccably, for some reason I wrote clean and well-behaved children. <laughs> 
Yeah, I feel like people imagine a spa treatment, like something mm-hmm. something expensive and luxurious. They're like, great, I can just drop this amount of money on it and then check. I can check off my self-care item in my bullet journal. Um, yeah, and that's the thing. It's now performative. It's now something that is you're, we're supposed to put on social media so that we can feel like it's we are cool. Symbol. Yeah, it's a status symbol. Exactly. Um, I went on Instagram and kind of looked around the self-care hashtag, hashtag self-care, and I found some stuff like a bath bomb company being like, here's some bath bombs that we sell, hashtag self-care. And like a woman who has a fitness account taking a selfie after like a weightlifting session, um, some bagel place having <laughs> showing up a plate with like some bagel, bagel fixings on it. Um, and a woman getting Botox. <laughs> um, but The real self-care. Right? I know. The thing is that technically any of these, like even the Botox could be part of self-care. But just you, just dropping the money does not mean that you can check it off. So, I mean, like, so what is self-care actually? Well, the source that I used for most of this was a woman named Raphaelia Michael, who is a psychologist. And basically she kind of boils it down to it's any activity that we do deliberately in order to take care of our mental, emotional, and physical health. And like, yeah, let's be clear. If you're an anti-fascist organizer and you live in a state where fascism is on the rise, then yes, that is absolutely an act of political warfare. Um, She says, Barfalia Michael says, self-care needs to be something you actively plan rather than something that just happens. It is an active choice and you must treat it as such. Um, Add certain activities to your calendar, announce your plans to others in order to increase your commitment and actively look for opportunities to practice self-care. Um, she says, keeping a conscious mind is what counts. In other words, if you don't see something as self-care or don't do something in order to take care of yourself, it won't work as such. Be aware of what you do, why you do it, how it feels, and what the outcomes are. So, you know, awareness and intentionality is E. You have to do it with your whole brain as well as your whole ass. And um, you have to plan it and commit to it. Um, You have to talk out both sides of your brain. Yeah, exactly. So she had kind of a big list, a checklist. I think she called it a a checklist, but I don't even want to call it a checklist because I think checklists, you know, feeling kind of anti-checklist right now. Um, Her list of stuff that you can do for self-care has... I think it has kind of some privilege issues, some accessibility issues. But uh, if we say, you know, I'm going to append a big old if you're able to do these things to the front of the list. Um, You know, if you're able to create a no list, that's N-O, not K-N-O-W, and put things that you know you don't like or you no longer want to do. This could include checking emails at night. (laughs) This is also kind of pre-COVID. She says not attending gatherings that you don't like, which is valid, but don't get on Zoom calls if they're social calls with people you don't like not answering your phone during lunch or dinner. Um, Something else you can do that I saw elsewhere is you can take a digital Sabbath, which is like pick a day when you're just not gonna answer your emails or your texts or all of the above or whatever. And let your contacts know ahead of time that you, you're you going to take this day and be like, I just won't be answering my email on this day, so I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I actually, when, when I was working in New Mexico, the house man, I was assistant house manager, but the house manager, would he would just like barricade himself inside his apartment basically and just say like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just going to sit on my ass and just do what I want to do for today and then I can go back to work on Monday. It was great. It was fucking yeah. praxis. That's a beautiful, exactly. That's praxis. Self-care is praxis, guys. Yeah, and that's a great way to do it. Um, it's That's literally reclaiming your time. Um, I forgot to pay homage to Magazine Waters and her extremely badass uh, takedown of Steven Mnuchin from 2017 where she kind of brought that phrase to our imaginations, that reclaiming our time. It was amazing. Um, but yeah, like taking a digital Sabbath. Um, it's totally with, uh, Ellie Abrams. Oh, did she do it with? Did it happen again? Yeah, she had. Uh, she had a similar moment with Elliot Abrams, uh, like last March, I want to say. Oh, nice. She's great. She's she's amazing. <laughs> I didn't know that actually, like, you can, the thing that she did is explicitly house rules. You can explicitly tell some bullshitter that you're reclaiming your time. Um, And everyone should do that. Everyone should take a digital Sabbath or whatever if you can. And let's not forget the time that she bodied uh, Michael Tracy uh, in Washington, D.C. Really? Yes. (laughs) 
she basically brushed up against him and he made a big deal about it on Twitter and said that he was assaulted by her. Oh, wow. So Maxine Waters is a badass and will physically assault you. She don't fuck with Maxine Waters and we are all going to try and be more like her. <laughs> she uh, she took on the CIA in like the late 90s. Uh, really? Because, because the CIA was uh, was like uh, like airlifting drugs. Like I think like they were like airlifting heroin into her congressional district for Mexico. You know, as you do, as the CIA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Typical CIA behavior. As, as part of like Iran Contra, and she like actively like was calling out the CIA for this, and it was like pissing people off at the, at the Pentagon. It's like you're not supposed to be exposing it, like the shit the CIA does. We do what we want here. God, she must have a, a lot of guards guards at her her residence. And this was like 1995. <laughs> it's like 1995, and she's like, I've got to deal with the CIA killing my constituents. I don't really care about like the foreign implications of this. Maxine Waters, can you come hang out with us, please? I want to hang out with Maxine Waters. <laughs> please. Yeah, I'm sure she's listening. <laughs> I know she's listening. <laughs> she's working uh, out listening podcasts. to our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> she's bulking up. She's getting ready. She must be one of those, what, 18 people that listen to the podcast. <laughs> just fucking tag her on Twitter when you make the tweet about it, Scott. Just tag her account. Some staffer will read it. See what happens. Hell yeah. We love you, Maxine. Randomly harassing uh, <laughs> politicians on Twitter. That's what's going to get, a, get us the bump them. we need. Standing and harassing are, are inverses, I believe. Anyway, so there's other things that you can do uh, for self-care. Um, taking care of your body is important, so eating nutritious foods is important. However, in keeping with the, the kind of doctrines of self-care, forcing yourself to eat something that's healthy that you hate is not self-care. So, like, find out what's in the middle of that vent diagram you know like and eat it i drink a lot of smoothies because pulverized fruit mixed with milk is 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 one of the few fruits and veggies that i actually enjoy um get enough sleep again if you can you know six to nine hours um i've seen seven or eight but yeah your mileage may vary get enough sleep if you can um exercise if you can and again do something you like I take dance classes. There is a certain video game I play called that rhymes with meat taper. <laughs> um, and if chase, you know, chase Nazis, chase Nazis. Yeah, exactly. Rhymes with what? It's called Beat Saber. I don't know why I'm being all secretive about it. What do you say? Um, meat, meat Saber? Play Among Us. Beat, Get really mad at everyone. Meat Saber beat sounds scandalous saber. as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I know have what, no idea what this is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know. It just the the beat the the video game I played is not important. Anyway, the important part is choosing a form of exercise that you like, or at least you know can tolerate. Make it fun. Listen to a podcast. Listen to our podcast. Tell us in, to listen to our swim, podcast. Go to the beach. Fine. Yeah. Find time in your busy schedule to go chill at the beach. Get in the ocean. And let Listen the ocean. to our podcast when you're working out with Maxine Waters. Yeah, yeah. in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, when you're swimming with Maxine Waters. Put them on. <laughs> Put on the pod. It's perfect. In the BuzzFeed article, your... five podcasts to listen to while swimming in the ocean with Maxine yeah. Waters. We're number one. Um, waterproof. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> get get your little waterproof. Uh, I had one of those when I thought I was going to start swimming. You can strap your phone to your arm while you're swimming, and it protects it from the water. Um, anyway, get, go to the doctor. Go to the doctor because not going to the doctor is sucky, and you deserve to take care of your body. Um, do relaxation exercises or meditate, and you don't even have to like. You can do them whenever. You can do them. For fucking whatever i used to meditate on the tea on the way to work for like you know 20 10 minutes at a time or while waiting for i was you know at my old job i would wait for meetings to start be sitting there people be coming in i'd just be meditating in the corner like not you know not in a full lotus or whatever you don't have to do that um half meditating lotus. can be half lotus yeah i get like knee positions and tie tie uh knots confused um or just knots in general anyway uh, i was just fucking around I yeah, don't know cool. half lotus I don't know. Is... oh really <laughs> okay no, I well no actually you know, i don't I, know i don't think that's a real thing i probably. think i'm just but you know you guys know what i'm talking about that's the important thing i'm just being evocative uh you can meditate in any fucking position you can meditate uh on the toilet i'm just gonna keep bringing up stuff you can do on the toilet actually ramdas who was like my main spiritual dude was always like don't force yourself to meditate i would rather have you not do any spiritual practices at all until you just feel like you 
you need to so bad, like in the same way that you go to the toilet when you feel like you need to go to the toilet. And then he he was like, that's great. We should say like, come do spiritual practice. It's like going to the toilet. Um, But you really can. Like, again, if it's self-care, it has to be something that is nourishing to you that, you know, you feel good about doing. That's a huge part. Um, there's, there's a few more things on this list. Oh, yeah. Spend enough time with your loved ones if you can. That's a big thing. Um, do something relaxing every day. You know, take a walk or just lie on the floor watching, um, I don't know, whose favorite YouTuber. My favorite YouTuber is The Craftsman uh, for half an hour, whatever. Just take some time and unwind. Um, she stares says, the out the window. Yeah, there you go. And that could be meditative, too. And finally, Michael says do also in addition to that, she says do at least one pleasurable activity every day. Back in the before times, we could go to the movies or meet up with our friends. But, you know, like talking to your friends is nice. Talking to you guys is self-care for me, usually. And yeah, look for opportunities to laugh. So like self-care can mean all of these things. It can mean like eating well, sleeping well, whatever. But it can mean like playing with your kid, playing with your cat. Um, looking at videos of cute hamsters for like a minute and a half, whatever that you have time to do that's nourishing to you, um, nourishing to your mind or your body or your spirit or all of them. And that's the thing. Every little bit helps. It could be 30 seconds. And a day when in which you've only done 30 seconds of self-care is still better than a day when you didn't do any at all um, and when you weren't able to do any at all. Um, obviously, there's some disclaimers with self-care. First off, don't fall for the belief that self-care is only for keeping you in good enough shape to keep selling your labor. That's not how it is. You are actually a worthy human being just as you are for real and self-care is like a good way to show yourself respect and show yourself love and um also self-care is harm reduction like the burden of self-preservation should not fall solely on the labor on the individual we still need medicare for all it's not an acceptable standard for self for social care we need you know structure of care in dsa i'm gonna talk more about that on saturday so anyway the bottom Bottom line here, what are the things you can do to reclaim your time? If you have a job that gives you vacation days, use them. If your bosses didn't want you to use them, they shouldn't have given them to you. Um, if you've been at your job a long time or whatever, and you have leverage, if you have a really good relationship with your bosses, if you feel like you, uh, you know, my dad has done this many times. I'm not going to, we have to cut this out later, but I hope not. I'm not going to like say who he is or anything. He's, you know, he's very respected at his job, extremely respected. And so many times if he can't seem to get like if shit's going down and he can't fix it he'll um write a resignation letter up he'll type it out he'll print it up and he literally will like slap it down on the whoever his superior's desk is and just be like look you gotta fix this or i'm gone not everyone can do that i think it's pretty badass but <laughs> yeah that's actually that's time. fucking that's dope i'm gonna if you can do that out of my back pocket. Oh, that's great <laughs> yeah no i mean like it doesn't have to be that dramatic no not everyone can be maxine waters not everyone could be my dad um but you know if you have a good relationship with your employer you'd be surprised what you can win you can you know be, try and adjust your schedule the one that's healthy and right for you be like you know i've really been wanting to work on this this project for a long time and i just don't i just can't do it if i'm here 40 hours a week or whatever you know do whatever you can just give it a try just don't assume it's impossible if you really don't think it is um yeah self-care you know schedule some self-care and commit to it have some hobbies do a little exercise do some spiritual pursuits spend time time with your friends watch hamster videos absolutely just plan it commit to it just be intentional about it and do it as a middle finger to the capitalist machine um a slide that i accidentally skipped earlier even as i tell you like this is how you do self-care it's absolutely easier said than done like starting to think of yourself as a being that deserves to rest you would be fucking surprised it it can require like a ton you can you know whoop you gotta like turn your head 180 degrees sometimes um and not just because there's this cultural influence from the outside telling us that we're only worth anything if we run ourselves into the ground. But, you know, some of us grow up with shit. Like, actually, until not that long ago, I was dealing with unprocessed trauma from when I was a toddler that directly contributed to me being, like, extra vulnerable to the shit and, like, feeling like having a really hard time resting ever. Like, even if I had free time and I wasn't doing anything, I just felt felt awful but like so you know you might have the same problem you might have a similar issue so the answer is if you can work on yourself 
working on yourself is actually the best thing you can do for yourself and other people. Um, that's another like Ram Dass thing. I'm going to talk about him more in a minute. Um, you know, so work on yourself. It's it's going to help you get used to thinking of yourself. Life is just really awesome. And it gets, you'd be surprised how, how more awesome life gets when you're actually like actively curious about why you act the way you do and why you feel the way you feel about stuff. Um, it's really awesome. And, it, you know, it doesn't always have to be therapy. You could be leveraging emotional connections you already have, like turn to your closest comrades, talk, have, you know, sort of intentional discussion about this stuff and help each other commit to maintaining, you know, your own commitment to yourself and self-care. Like my friends and I do this all the time. It's fucking great. There's also, you know, there's mental health apps that I can't guarantee are amazing or will help you out the same amount. But there's stuff like mood tools, um, mood paths, super better, seven cups of tea, just like stuff that help with self-reflection, mindfulness, um, CBT. You can also, I would say, consider pursuing a spiritual practice. If you like that joke about Med- <laughs> about meditation being like about spiritual practice being like going to the toilet i highly recommend bhakti yoga it's fucking great and it doesn't require a lot of dogma like religion does um just uh just google ramdas r a m d a s s and actually the, his uh foundation just put out something called the official ramdas starter kit it's just like a nice a step-by-step guide for your journey blah 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 it's got like a really nice kind of condensed set of his teachings check them out see if you like them see if you want to get into that or you know any any spiritual practice anything that can you know na na could be a thing anything that helps you work on yourself and like become just like a an endlessly uh blooming flower because like sorry that's real cheesy but, but like you will be fucking surprised at how you know at who you can become and how you know also it'll be easier to take care of it gets easier and easier to keep taking care of yourself and doing all this stuff that we're talking about um you know you said it uh it might sound cheesy but like in na we say something that might sound even cheesier and that is we will love you until you learn how to love yourself that's and, dope yeah yeah bhakti yoga is like you are loved by an unending love there is love and you are loved you are always loved it's a big part of it go on sorry i have relationships with other people in na who um have expressed like a lot of gratitude to me for basically being loving and uh being patient and tolerant with them when other people in their lives couldn't be so i've seen it happen and i've been a part of that and it's fucking incredible exactly so yeah i mean you know wherever you're at wherever you're starting from whatever works for you is important self the whole thing with self-care is like what works for you commit to finding that and following it. Um, something that we we all can do regardless of what path we might end up on. Um, I find it really powerful to, to stop like saying the phrase I should, like stop shoulding on yourself. Hell like, yeah. Right? Big it's endorsement. A, it's a big deal. Like it's a, it's a lot of bang for your buck there. If you start, try, even if you're just thinking it to yourself, stop and be like, well, I could do that. I found that saying I could or I will is like a very good substitute say i can i can that's also good yeah i, I can't can, do I it can. eventually <laughs> well yeah even even that includes i will so i guess it's better than nothing <laughs> And yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it for me. I do have these two quotes uh, at the end of the thing, which is Brene Brown saying, it takes courage to say yes to rest and play in a culture where exhaustion is seen as a status symbol. And Billy Walker said, dismissing our status as beings of productivity amongst other refusals can be seen as a daily act of anti-fascist resistance. So there you go. Hell yeah. That's that's the deal. Self-care, y'all. Yeah. Thank you. It's not going to be that long on Saturday. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. Indeed. Absolutely. Uh, oh, that was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. We've been talking for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe that should be it. That Yeah. I'm just going to pull a movie recommendation out of nowhere. Comrades, God, tells you what to watch. Uh, I've been thinking about it for a couple weeks. Uh, you should watch Kelly Reichardt's Certain Women. It's a good movie. It has nothing to do with the topics that we're talking about this week, but it's good. <laughs> Tell me um, what else to watch this week. Tell me what to watch. Um, 
Bro, I don't know, man. What's like? What are you in Joe, the mood for? <laughs> go on Netflix. Go on Netflix and watch Three Idiots. It's a Bollywood movie that I watched both yesterday and the day before because it's very long because it's a Bollywood movie. But uh, it's a super cute and fun movie about three dudes who go to engineering school in India, and it's about them fighting against the draconian uh, results-oriented structure of the school and getting in touch with the a true love of learning and also there's a lot of well there's a couple musical numbers because it's a Bollywood movie <laughs> and there's like a romantic storyline which is kind of dumb okay, but whatever I don't know that always happens it's a fun movie highly recommend oh here's a recommendation for you Joe watch the uh, three hour cut of David Lynch's Dune I haven't seen that and I plan to watch it this week at some point so watch that I find this is that the director's cut uh it's, I mean like technically yeah have we talked about the new Dune yet on the pod? We haven't yet. What is your... Do you have any uh, hot takes? Um... So it's just worm? <laughs> yeah, obviously worm is a hot take. Whoa. Give me that worm, as you said. Um, I don't know. I think that Timothy Chalamet's uh, husky uh, performance of Paul Atreides is exciting, interesting, and, like, it's extremely husky. husky. It's very husky. Have you... You, you don't think so? <laughs> <coughs> I mean, not really. A- anyway. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. His voice. His voice is not him, just his voice. Uh, All right. So why don't you uh, take us out, Scott? All right. I guess we're cutting the Dune talk short. Um, (laughs) I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it again. I didn't mean to do it again. No, it's fine. I don't care. Talk about (laughs) Dune. There's not a whole lot of... It looks looks dark. It looks like... uh... Okay, here's the thing. This is the only thing I want to talk about about this movie is that it it looks fine. It looks like every fucking movie nowadays. It's, It's only the first half of the novel and nobody's talking about that. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, they're splitting it up into two movies. Maybe that's for the best. No, it probably is because there's a point halfway spoilers for Dune. It came out in 1969 for Christ's sake. <laughs> but halfway through the novel, when they go into the desert of Arrakis and they like start living among the free men, mm-hmm. uh, when Paul marries Johnny and they have their daughter or their first son, excuse me. The first Leo, the second, who is then later killed two years later. That's the perfect place to stop the movie is like at that two year, like right when he's born and then start the next movie when the after the two year jump has happened. So mm. there's a perfect place in the novel for them to do that. So I guess it's been a while since I read the novel. I have read the novel, but whenever I think of Dune, I literally only ever think of the, the Lynch Dune from 84. I mean, but that's what that's what Herbert was trying to do. He's trying to like. To, like tell multiple stories with like not just the first dune but like m- all of the series you know right yeah because it is like dune is like four different narratives at once mm. okay you have the, you have my attention four different narratives at once it's it's very complex like it's just the story it's very it's a, it's very grand and it, it <laughs> right. brought yeah. the the concept of ecology to science well the novel to, to science fiction so and yeah. in a so way where can i find this and in a way i mean like you can at the library you can find the Dune book at any bookstore or any library. The the, no, I'm with that. the extended cut of the of the of, of Lynch's I you torrent it, bro. That's what I did. <laughs> Oh, um, no. The, the RAA is going to come get you. Fuck him. I'm not sure. It was the MPA. Not even once. <laughs> fuck him. And also, it would have to be, like, the French, because that was the edition that I... Uh, you wouldn't Because the extended download. edition, I think, was, like... A car. Like that, so. You watched a French dub? I would download a car you if I could. You wouldn't download you. your I, I, that's, I've, always had the, I've always had a problem with that <laughs> fucking thing, where it's like, you wouldn't download a car if you could. It's like, yes, I would. Yes, I would. As soon as I could. Like, dude... Come on. You wouldn't download an abandoned kitten. Yes, they would. Yes, especially <laughs> if it's abandoned. Yeah, come on. God, I gotta save this cat out here. But anyways, all right, this has been fun. My name is Scott. You can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Death Mullet. Joe, you want to go? Joe, you want to go? Joe, go. I want to go. Joe, uh, you can find me on the internet. It's not that hard. Uh, just another average Joe. Uh, someone else go. I'm Kit. I'm scared of all of the hell sites, so you're not going to find me. <laughs> but that's cool. Brad, I'm Ellie. And similarly, you're not, you're not, you're not going to find me. You're not, you're going to find me. You're not. Um, except for here on this podcast. Scott, go. Did you go already? <laughs> 
And I, <laughs> and I am Jesse. I started it. Yes, I went. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm Jesse, and you can find me on SoundCloud at my cat is doing something. <laughs> SoundCloud.com slash my cat. <laughs> my cat is doing something. <laughs> What's the name of your band? Well, changing. You can find me on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash contingent. My cat is doing something. <laughs> uh, slash contingent. Did you have a title for your next song? Yeah. Um, and please remember, especially as we're talking about uh, mental health, as we have been lately on this podcast, please remember to hit up comrade-rosie.org and remember to check out that Getting Involved tab. Uh, there's a huge list of mutual aid groups in the greater Boston area that you can donate to or contact if you want to volunteer because we need your fucking help. Everybody needs your help, yo. Um, there's a lot of unhoused individuals in Boston that they need to eat too. Shit, they need to eat more than we need to eat right now. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, and we have a Twitter and we have an Instagram. Those are both at Epic Incredulity. We have a Facebook. Just search for the Epoch of Incredulity. And also we have an Instagram. Or excuse me, we have a Patreon. Wow. Uh, we have a Patreon. That's also at Epic Incredulity. If you can, throw us a dollar or two if you want. Um, we're also on YouTube. Search for the, for the same thing, the name of our podcast. And yeah, as always, go to comrade-rosie.org and get involved. And that's your Epoch for the week. Thank you. Enjoy your Epoch. I was trying to think of that thing you said during your presentation, like well-behaved children. Clean and well-behaved children. That's your epoch for the week, you clean and well-behaved children. Honestly, when Jesse said was about to start talking about Comrade Rosie, I honestly thought he was going to go tell people to go get a cat. Oh, you shouldn't have told people to go get a cat if you can. Or you know or what's a good squirrel? for your mental health? Go get a cat. Or a go squirrel. Get a cat. Squirrel. Get get a squirrel. Or get no. Craig out of here. Jeez. He's a cat named Squirrel. I have a cat <laughs> named Squirrel. That's, I guess the honestly, best that's worlds. That's been confusing having a cat named Squirrel and a squirrel that Ninja. isn't named Cat. <laughs> It doesn't help that her nickname is also another squid. Animal. Yeah. All right. This is going to make the super cut, but there, the fact that there is a fucking super cut, there is a wasp called the tarantula hawk wasp. <laughs> Like spooky. It's just three completely different animals. <laughs> yeah, there's always like, like the eastern, you know, goose hornet, but that one of those is another animal, not both of them. Shout out to the blue fairy penguins because that's what they're actually called. Little blue penguins, blue fairy penguins. They're blue penguins. Yeah, yeah. they're tiny Fuck. and they're adorable. Yeah. I'm googling this. Right I did now. not know this. They're... There's an island off the coast of Adelaide where I live that had a lot of them. Yeah, and they're, they're like native to New Zealand, and uh, oh, they're, they're warm they're weather South. penguins. Yeah. No, no, this has existed. Little blue fairy penguins. Oh my god, they don't look real. They I look know. Like Why weren't these ones in, the ones in Happy Feet? What's going on? You dip to a People spook them. People Aww. spook them really badly. It's kind of sad. Um, <laughs> if and if and when you go to the Boston Aquarium, listeners, I suggest you start with the little blue penguins because they are the cutest fucking creatures on the face of the earth. Wait, they have these at the New England Aquarium? They do. I went there specifically just to see them, and I was not disappointed. I got to pet a stingray too. That's awesome. Yeah, or I don't know why I don't. Adelaide, Adelaide ever? I mean, not right now. Because because you can't. But if you visit Adelaide, you should you should definitely take a trip. And and there, there's a whole bunch of islands. Um, but but they're cute. You should listen to the Ben Fold song Adelaide on repeat for the whole plane ride. There's a song by Amberlin called to Adelaide travel. too. Who's it by? Amberlin. Oh, huh. I can look that one up too. It's another like insidious to Christian rock band. <laughs> like the Devil Wears Prada. I used to think they were so fucking cool. And then like I analyzed the lyrics and I was like, this is about God. <laughs> All Christian rock bands are weird. You're fucking weird. You just gotta replace Jesus with baby. Or baby with Jesus. Catholic is fucking weird. That's where I'm gonna add that you just gotta replace Jesus with baby. <laughs> Accurate, though. <laughs>